The bliss of the abyss is here now. Welcome back to The Bliss of the Abyss. My name is Robert Newmark Jones. I'm your host, the only host you've ever known. Um, apologies for the delay in getting all this information to you. Um, <clears throat> by information, I mean new episode. Uh, basically, to not bore you to death, uh, which is a difficult thing for me to do, I suppose. Um, I recorded an incredible episode with Patrick Sanford, which will be coming soon. Um, it's a it's a long one, and it deals with some quite serious issues um, in a you know an appropriate way, but it's quite taxing to to edit. I've also been um, unwell of late. I, I think I have um, an undiagnosed stomach condition, so I've. I've really been in and out of um yeah medical assistance and um that's not helped things. Uh alongside that, I have actually had some work as well, which is nice. So I've been trying to trying to keep myself sane and trying to keep myself relatively healthy and work. Uh roof over my head, shoes on my feet, and unfortunately the podcast has taken a little bit of a backseat as a result of that, for which I do apologise. Patreon subscribers will recognise I am still putting out the Patreon episodes um, because uh, you pay me to do that, <laughs> and I love you more because of that. I'm mercantile. Um, so uh, I'm going to be coming with that Patrick Sanford um episode soon and I promise you it, it's going to be worth the wait. It's a remarkable story um, about uh, a theatre director, uh, an incident that happened in his youth that went unspoken for 30 years and ended up with him becoming an activist and visiting the Vatican um, in an official, official capacity. Uh, so uh, that's that's going to be coming up, and that's going to be an absolutely barnstorming episode as and when it comes. In the meantime, <sighs> um, uh, I was recently on a podcast called The D-Listers of History, and I'm going to put their episode in this feed um, because it's just so fantastic. And they are, like me, they are a small show. Um, which could do with the support and the extra subscribers, I'm sure. So I'm putting this episode into the feed. I'm going to drop all their links. So please hit them up, like them, subscribe to them. Um, this is a podcast where um, stories of remarkable people from history that you've never heard of are told. And... Um, my episode was about a guy called Uriah Levy, um, who has one of the more remarkable stories in American history that you'll ever come across. Um, was responsible for having flogging banned, for example. Contributed the only um, private statue um, in Washington, D.C. Um, there's all kinds of strange and very curious um, twists and turns in his uh, amazing story. So uh, I'm going to put it here. I recommend you subscribe to their feed as well as it's fantastic. Um, and I'll be back with that pa Patrick uh, Sanford episode just as soon as I can. Um, and thanks for sticking with me. I know I'm not the most reliable. It's very much a one man operation. <laughs> um, and I'm trying my best, but uh, I love you very much. Thank you for supporting the show. Without any further ado, this is my episode on D-Listers of History. <laughs> History, a podcast about people you've never heard of who changed the world. My name is Fega, and I am one of your co-hosts. And I am introducing our episode here where I got to have a conversation with the actor Robert Newmark Jones. 
Robert is an actor on the West End. He's also a producer and a writer with lots of credits doing all sorts of really interesting things. He also has a weekly podcast called Bliss of the Abyss. With anti-Semitism on the rise on both sides of the pond, and given that Robert and I are both Jewish, it seemed appropriate to talk about Uriah Levy, who is the person who brought the conversation about anti-Semitism in America into the mainstream all the way back in the 19th century. Levy's way of doing this was somewhat unconventional and involved quite a bit of physical combat and dueling and that sort of thing. Because his story is so wild, even though I cut out as much as I possibly could, this episode still clocked in longer than it usually does. So I apologize for that, but I promise you every bit of the story that's there is worth it. Also, when we recorded, I had only just gotten over COVID, so please excuse my sort of interesting vocal quality. You could come with me. You could come with me. Okay, hello. Welcome. You Rob, you have quite the name, Robert Benedict Newmark Jones. I know. I apologize. I didn't pick it myself. I have a, a friend, actually another theater person, who has a similar name, and we call him Jason All the Names. <laughs> I'll be Robert All the Names. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> so, welcome. Thank you. So we're going to talk about Uriah Levy today, who's an interesting, interesting dude in American history. The the thing that he tends to get remembered for is he's the first Jewish Commodore of the United States Navy, which Rock sounds kind of boring, but it's Does way it? more interesting than that. Oh, man. If that sounds boring to you, let me explain to you what my life is like. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just you look him up online and the Navy what like thing is just like he was on this ship and this ship and this ship. But it's like there's way more to it than that. I think they kind of want to hide it because he's a bit of a troublemaker. Uh. Yeah. So what I thought was sort of interesting with this is I saw that you were doing a show just before COVID locked everything down that dealt with the issue of anti-Semitism, which is really a central piece of Uriah Levy's story. So I was just curious about your experience with that show. It was, what was it called? One Jewish Boy, I believe. That's right. Yes. Yes, indeed. We were on the, we were on the West End. It was a it was a transfer for well for your American listeners that's the English version of Broadway. It was um it was a transfer from our version of Off West End. So we were a week into our run, uh, and then a little somebody drank some bat soup halfway around the world, or some version of the story, whatever you want to believe, <laughs> and everything was locked down. So we we only got a week of of the run, but the play itself was an amazing piece of original writing about inherited trauma and anti-Semitism and the way that these things intersect through the generations and how to try and avoid, but maybe uh, fail to avoid passing them down through generations and all the trials and tribulations that the Jewish people can and do face in uh, in various situations so it was it was a really good piece of writing very affecting i was excellent as you can imagine of course everyone else was all right no 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 it was good <laughs> and it lives on in in digital format if you want to find it out there oh cool yeah i ordered the script because i was very curious about it the uriah levy he was born on april 22nd 1792 in philadelphia pennsylvania which is where i am which is mm. why i know about this guy he was born to Michael and Rachel Phillips Levy. He was close to his maternal grandfather, Jonas Phillips, who had emigrated to the United States in 1756 from Germany. And he fought in the Philadelphia militia in the American Revolution. Uh. The other side of his family were Portuguese Jews. So, And so at this time, too, there's also a lot of assimilation going on mm. because the Jewish community is very small at this point in the United States, especially in Philadelphia. It was bigger in Philadelphia and in New York than other places, but compared to what we look at today, it was minuscule. Mm. And so you had a a predominant synagogue here in Philadelphia, which still exists, like Israel. They were doing pretty well for themselves by the time Uriah, Uriah Levy shows up. They actually had a synagogue building, which is very exciting, Cherry Alley, in what's now called Old City Philadelphia. They had, which included a home for the Chazan, which is like the person who does the singing. 
in the services, a school, a mikvah, which is a ritual bath, and an oven for cooking matzah during Passover. So they were like, yeah. had a pretty good, Not pretty bad. good setup going. By the way, completely unimportant to this, but Benjamin Franklin helped pay for said synagogue, which is one of those things that. What a bench. Like, yep. Uh, he didn't give that much money, but oh, I was like, oh Ben Franklin. Stinch. Yeah, no, I know. He, <laughs> he he chipped in five bucks, and everyone was like, "We'll put his name on the wall, though, right?" <laughs> yes, that's. I mean, that's everything in Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, we're just like Ben Franklin walked over here once. <laughs> um, we're so excited about him because the community is really small. For people in this community, if you wanted to have upward mobility socially, sometimes you had to marry non-Jews, and so there was a lot of just like stress around this. And this is something that I think. In the Jewish community, everyone's always having a bit of a a breakdown about intermarriage. Yeah. um, That it's going to destroy everything. (sighs) They thought that in the the 18th century, too. Like, this this has always been a concern. Endless conniptions over the whole course of history about this. Yes. And so this is important because Levy was really concerned about assimilation. He wanted to stand against assimilation. So he's born, he's in Philly, he grows up. When he's 10 years old, he decides to run away to be a cabin boy on various ships. Philadelphia at the time was the largest city in the United States and second largest English-speaking city in the world after London. Oh, cool. Yeah. We hold on to that really hard because that didn't last very long. (laughs) (laughs) Couple of weeks there. Yeah. (laughs) So it was definitely a place where if you wanted to get into sailing, you just hopped on a ship and went. But even at that young age, he was concerned about his Jewish identity. So the family lore says at the age of 13, he came home just to have his bar mitzvah. Oh, that's sweet. I know, right? Isn't that sweet? Yeah. And as my voice continues to die, I I had COVID last week. Oh, no. We're going to see how this goes. I have tea. We're going to see how it goes. Okay. I'm here for you. Don't worry. So he goes, he learns how to be a sailor. He's growing up, doing his thing, which back in those days is just a lot of you hop from ship to ship. Mm-hmm. Doing yeah. your thing. Lots of rigging. Yeah. Um, and in 1807, there's something called the Embargo Act. And this is important because that act said that United States merchants and shipping and so forth could not trade with any European countries that were not England or France. Whoa. Yeah. Who, who made this decision? Well, it was under the Jefferson administration. I don't know a ton about the background on the Embargo Act. This was a time when things were really weird and stressful. Mm. in the u.s around our relationship with england because well because actually leading right into this well because, uh, yeah. we're in the lead up to the war of 1812 and the war of 1812 i love the war of 1812 because depending on where you are in the united states or sorry not the united states in the world mm. you either don't know anything about it because <laughs> it's this weird forgotten war or it's like a central part of your like identity so if you're in the united right. states you either don't know about it you don't care about it whatever in Canada, this is like, this is the thing that made us Canadians. Like, <laughs> it is a big deal. And I think in the rest of the world, it's kind of like, what? Yeah. <laughs> doing what now? <laughs> Can we still trade? No. Oh, why? So Canadians. Well. 1812, there's a lot of reasons for it. Hmm. But one of the main reasons was the British Navy had a habit of going to American ports And just like grabbing random Americans and forcing them to join the British Navy. Mm, That's going to breed resentment. Yeah, it wasn't a popular move. Not a good move. Yeah. And so there was all this stuff going on, all this stress going on. So while he's basically he's grounded, it's kind of like kind of like COVID for us performers, right? We're like, all of a sudden we're like, okay, what am I doing with myself? (laughs) So he used that time to attend navigation school in Philadelphia to advance his career. Two years later, Embargo Act lifts. So the impressment gangs are back back on their thing. These gangs would go into various port towns, not just in the United States, but anywhere where American sailors might be, just to, like, grab them. You there, and, young whippersnapper. Come aboard. You're an Englishman now, that kind of thing. Yes, pretty much exactly that. Right. That's, <laughs> that's a terrible idea. I, I'll have a word with them and see what we can do. <laughs> well, we fought a war over it in the end. Yeah. The British Navy kept doing it. <laughs> And we learned nothing. Wonderful. Yes, except our our capital got burned in the process. Oh, there we go. That was great. (laughs) One of the ways you could avoid this getting picked up was you could have a certificate that certified that you were a U.S. citizen and a sailor. Right. So Uriah Levy had one of these. 
And so he wasn't really concerned about these press gangs. So he was in a tavern or something in Philadelphia Mm. and the call comes out, the press gang's coming. Everybody's like running away and he's just chilling. Cause he's like, I've got my, I've got (sighs) my paperwork. I it's, it's fine. I'm going to finish my drink. So the press gang comes in and they're like, come on, you there, come. He goes, no, 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 no. I've got my, I've got my papers here. I should note, I've got some real, some quotes. And these quotes, for the most part, come from Uriah Levy's memoirs. So these are like half-remembered things. They may be apocryphal. He might be playing his part up a little bit, shall we say. Yes, there's a lot of these that sound like something you would come up with later after the event in the shower, like as the thing I should have said. So take these with a mountain of salt. Lovely. So Uriah Levy... He gives his papers and the leader of the press gang looks at the certificate and says, you don't look like an American to me. You look like a Jew. (sighs) Yeah. And this is for those outside the Jewish community. This is really common. This idea that Jews are not fully Mm. citizens of the places that we live. And so Levy claims that he responded, I am an American and a Jew. Yeah. And the leader quipped, if Americans have Jew peddlers manning their ships, no wonder they sail so badly. Ooh, them's fighting words. They are fighting words. And so in what became his signature move, <laughs> Levy punched the guy in the face. Yeah, Levy, Levy. <laughs> he does this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I won't cheer every punch then. I mean, it's a good okay. time. <laughs> One of the other guys in the press gang is not having this. And so he like hits Levy with his rifle, butt. Levy Oof. goes down and they take him on the ship down to Jamaica. And normally what would happen here is on the ship, whoever had been like picked up by the impressment gangs would be forced to take the oath of service. Or Fealty to the crown. Yes. Good. Right. Excellent. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was hard not to do that, but mm. apparently he was like just weird enough <laughs> <laughs> that he avoided it. <laughs> so he claims that every time they tried to force him to take the oath on the ship, he said, Sir, I cannot take the oath. I am an American and I cannot swear allegiance to your king. And I am a Hebrew and do not swear on your testament or with my head uncovered. God, I just want to stand up and sing the stars and stripes right now. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and for some reason, this worked. Like, usually this wouldn't, but apparently the guy on the captain was like, I don't know, this guy's super weird. Let's not even <laughs> worry about this. So they get down to Jamaica. He has a meeting with this guy, Sir Alexander Cochran, who's a British guy in the British Navy, and he's actually anti impressment mm. And he looks at the paperwork, says, yeah, you're an American. Go home. So Levy does. And Cochran, as a side note that has nothing to do with anything, he's actually one of the the leaders of the forces that were responsible for the burning of Washington, D.C. later on during the War of 1812. Oh, he's a complicated character. Okay. Yeah. And I've now told you all the things I know about (laughs) Alexander Cochran. Okay. Goodbye, Alexander. (laughs) Thank you. Bye. You served your purpose. (laughs) Set our hero free, after all. Yes. Levy goes home. He tries to be a partial ship owner in 1811. Gets that ship stolen out from under him in the Cape Verde Islands. Is a partial ship owner like some kind of timeshare thing? That sounds like a potential ripoff thing. It, it's sort of just like if you can't be the one ship owner, there's like three guys. Yeah, you get it on Wednesdays and Fridays. I'll have it the rest <laughs> of the week. Yeah, okay, got it. Kind of, or more like... like 20% is mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that kind of thing. Apparently, they didn't like him very much. He was off visiting somebody while they were at the Cape Verde Islands in Africa, and the, they just sailed the ship away. <laughs> that is something you can do with a ship that is going to be the problem he like hitchhikes home because apparently you can do that sure and the war of 1812 breaks out and levy now has two choices he can either be a privateer and a privateer is basically a nice word for pirate mm. the difference between a pirate and a privateer is a privateer is doing it on behalf of a government Right. Okay. So it's sort of legally sanctioned, but not really. It's like they'll look the other way if you're a privateer. Yeah. And the idea is that you're only going after the ships of whoever country's fighting. Privateering was a really good way of making lots of money. And his other option was to join the Navy, Mm. which most people in his situation would look at and say, this is not a good deal for him because the likelihood of him being able to rise up in ranks in the Navy is zero. Pretty much. He's a Jew. And also, yeah. 
And the pay is fine, but it's not great. But he thinks it's his patriotic duty. He really feels very strongly in his like, patriotism of being an American. So he's, mm. he joins the Navy. He is determined to rise up the ranks, which is very difficult. He's Jewish, so that's hard. And also, the officers were very much like an old boys club. Oh, of course. Yeah, So it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, you all went to the same posh schools and things like that that he would not have. So yeah. he's, he's got two things going against him here. Right. But he's a pugnacious outsider with a can-do attitude. Very pugnacious. <laughs> <laughs> so he joined up with a legendary ship, the USS Argus, who is known for running the British blockade and Ooh. just basically causing all sorts of problems on the English Channel. It came to be known as a ghost ship because it was just really good at avoiding being detected. Mm. There's this great story. Actually, Levy was at the helm when this happened. There's this great story of them literally just sailing through a British squadron during a foggy day, oh. and nobody saw them until they were like too far away. To no fire way. Them. Amazing. Very swashbuckling. Yeah. Apparently, when the ship was finally captured, when the crew was taken aboard the British ship, they, they were like cheered and clapped because there was just so much admiration. Because uh, like, of the sort of good fair play kind of spirit of Yes, things. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. A yeah. good old British spirit of fair play. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> so Levy was part of that ship. He wasn't there when it got captured because they had cap the Argus had captured another ship that was full of sugar. And this seemed too valuable just to like set mm, fire to. Yeah. And so they put Levy on the ship and said, go take this to France. And while he's on that ship, he gets captured and becomes a prisoner of war. And he ends up at Dartmoor Prison. Oh, no. Kent. You don't want to go to Kent. (laughs) So I don't know anything about this, but I found a another prisoner from that era wrote a poem about his experience at Dartmoor, which makes it sound pretty bad. So this is from a prisoner named Charles Andrews. Any man sent to Dartmoor might have exclaimed, hail horrors. Hail thou profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor, for any man ordered to this prison counted himself lost. Mm, yep, yeah, and it's still like that to this day, honestly. Yeah, I, I googled it and it didn't look... No. No, it looked like a fun time. He's there for 16 months. Jeez. And apparently it was a really rough time to be there because it was like a notably cold winter. Oh, like God. Apparent, apparently the Thames froze solid to the bottom. Really? Yeah. Jesus I mean, that's what Christmas. the book said. Yeah, so not a fun time to be uh, probably anywhere. In yeah. the whole world, <laughs> to yeah. be honest. Yeah, thank God it's yeah. 2024. But Levy, he's 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 always like trying to better himself. So he mm. takes his time while well, he's there to learn French and fencing. Wow. Okay. From cool. other prisoners. Sure. I mean, some people get jacked. Some people convert religion. He, you know, he learned French and fencing. You know, that's, that's the thing to do. Good. Yeah. Industrious. So war is over. He gets sent home and he decides that he is going to continue with the Navy. He talked to a friend about it who said that most people wouldn't care that he was a Jew, but the very few who would care would make his life hell. And Levy apparently took that as a challenge. Mm -hmm. So what he claims that he said in response to this, this is like, I think the most shower thought of shower thoughts. What will be the future of our Navy if others such as I refuse to serve because of the prejudice of a few? There will be other Hebrews in times to come of whom America will have need. By serving myself, I will help and give them a chance to serve. Oh, yeah. He loves a stirring speech, doesn't he, Uriah? Yeah. Yeah, he does. So trouble found him pretty quickly. (laughs) He was in uniform and dancing at a Philadelphia Patriots ball. And he accidentally brushed shoulders with a Lieutenant Potter. And he ignored it like a normal person. Right. But the Lieutenant came around again and collided with Levy. Levy ignores it again. And then Lieutenant Potter collides with him a third time. And mm. Levy's like, okay, we're, we're done. And he slaps the Lieutenant across the face. <gasps> with his glove or his open palm? What are we talking here? I'm assuming open palm. But yeah. I don't, it, they did not specify. It doesn't seem like the type that would like. <laughs> well, I just thought you might be challenging him to a duel. Either way, we're in we're in serious serious territory here. Yes, and and duels did happen here. So, in response, the lieutenant called him a damned Jew. <sighs> and, Technically correct, know, but an insult nevertheless. Yes. <laughs> so you know they had to be like held apart or whatever. So obviously, there's anti-Semitism going on here, but there's this added piece of now Levy not only is this Jewish guy who slapped an officer, because he's not an officer right now, he's an enlisted man. 
Right. He also is an illicit man who slapped an officer. Mm, which that's really is out, bad. And he's sort of like anti-Semitism is, is, is a problem yeah. to begin with. The lieutenant did not want to let it go. So the next morning he challenged Levy to a duel. Yeah. <laughs> God. And Levy was like, this is so stupid. <laughs> yeah. But he didn't want to be labeled a coward. No, that's the thing. You've got to take up the challenge of the duel, can't you? Especially because if he wants to rise up in the Navy, he can't yeah. be labeled a coward this early no. on. So they're both noted marksmen. So the duel is set up and they stood 20 paces away, which is much further away than a duel would normally be held. But because they were marksmen, I guess that was uh, seen as more fair. I don't know. This is one of the, this is actually, this is a wild story, but there's actually a ton of witnesses to this. So we know this actually happened. Cool. So during, in, in the setup to the duel, Levy was like, are you sure you want to do this? This is stupid. <laughs> And Lieutenant Potter's like, yes. And he's like, okay, fine. And so Levy just decides he's he's going. He's he's so extra. He goes and he just says the Shema right there in front of everybody. Whoa. Which is a prayer that one says before, well, for a lot of different reasons. But one of the times you're supposed to say is before you die. It's sort of like the Lord's Prayer for Jews, basically. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's one like, even if somebody doesn't know like any Hebrew, they probably yeah. know the Shema. And so he does that because he's just... So extra and so dramatic. I love him. <laughs> and he announced to the whole crowd that he would not be firing on his opponent, that he was not going to take aim on Lieutenant Potter. Ooh. So they go 20 paces away. And anyone who's seen Hamilton knows that like this is like a dangerous prospect. <laughs> yeah, the other guy still might pull the trigger. Potter gets the first f firing for whatever reason. Potter fires and misses Levy by like a lot. And Levy takes a shot in the air. Now, uh, most most of the time, that would be the end of it. Yeah. Like, cool, we did the duel. Honor is whatever. We yeah. Did it. But Potter is anti-Semite, so he's not, <laughs> he's, he's not <sighs> done. Potter decides he's going to try again. So he fires at Levy again, and he misses again. Levy shoots in the air again. Whoa. This happens five times. Five times? Yes. My God. And finally, Levy gets tired of this. And on the sixth shot, he says, very well, I'll spoil his dancing, which implies he was trying to shoot him in the leg or something. Yeah. But he ends up killing him. Oh, my God. <laughs> Dead Eye Levy. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, the other guy, he, you know, noted marksman, it proved to be perhaps a bit of a false reputation if he's going to miss five on a trot. Seriously. Like, he, yeah. he was, there's a lot of, like, maybe he was, like, so angry he wasn't. Yeah. You know, Apologia. Yeah. But at any rate, he misses and he ends up dying as a result. So now, now Levy's in a situation of being a Jewish enlisted man who has now killed an officer. And <laughs> Hold on, Uriah. Hold on, yep. it's getting rocky. And so the Navy, a Navy Commodore, investigates the situation and just dismisses it. He's like, this is, everyone says that Levy shot in the air five times. Like, what do you expect a guy to do? Mm. But a civil court in, or criminal court, I guess it would be, in Philadelphia, takes it up and a grand jury decides to indict him. <sighs> and they indict him for making a challenge to a duel. Which seems unfair <laughs> because he was the one who was challenged. Yeah. In the end, though, the jury acquits him. Oh, okay. Good. But this is why we know for sure that this this wild story actually happened is because we yeah. have this, like, this court evidence. But <laughs> trouble finds this guy wherever he goes. So not long <laughs> after this, he's acquitted. Fine, whatever. He's on a ship called the Franklin, and he's walking into a wardroom for breakfast. And he sits down at a table full of dirty dishes, and he asks a cabin boy to clean it up. Mm -hmm. ships run on a very like strict hierarchical level and cabin boys are like the bottom of the chain yeah that's where he started isn't it you're right yes. yeah yeah so so he knows yeah so while he's an illicit man he can't like give orders but he can no. be like hey man yeah, yeah yeah do this and it's not weird but for some reason on the other side of the room a lieutenant bond jumps up furiously and shouts at levy that he had no right to order the cabin boy to bring him breakfast, which is not what Levy asked him to do. And Levy just yells back at him. In the end, two officers and two cabin boys had to hold the two men apart from each other. A classic trope for Uriah. This is something that will often happen. Yes. I get the feel. Yeah. So there's a court martial. 
Oh my God, <laughs> he's back in court. And this is his first official court martial. Right. This one has a name, which I love. There's two names for it. One is the breakfast court martial, <laughs> or my preferred one, the tempest in the coffee cups. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The proceedings are as ludicrous as you might imagine. It's literally down to like how many coffee cups were on the table and like who is where. Just an absolutely absurd proceeding. Did they really have nothing better to do with their time? Apparently. Hmm. In the end, both men were reprimanded for unnaval-like behavior, which is basically just a slap on the wrist. Yeah. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> and most people at this point would lay low for a little bit. Right. Not Levy. Not Levy. He decides to apply for a commission to be an officer immediately after this happens. <laughs> and he gets it. Yes! <laughs> so March 5th, 1817, his commission was signed by President Monroe, and he becomes the first Jewish officer in the U.S. Navy. Of all time? Yes, Yes, Uriah, yeah. trailblazer. See, that speech came true. He knew yeah, it. Yeah, he did it. He gets transferred to the United States, which is an important ship, I guess. Oh, like the uh, USS United States. That sounds like yeah. it might be a pretty important one. Yeah. And it was very much run by an old boys club. <laughs> so the captain of the ship, Captain William Crane, is not happy about Levy being transferred to a ship. So he wrote to Commodore Charles Stewart to try to prevent it. And Stewart, bless this guy, I love him. He wrote back and said, since you gave me no specific notice of misconduct, I, I don't see any reason not to transfer yeah. Levy over. So Levy gets rowed over to the U United States, and the captain refuses to allow him on board and sends him back to his ship, the Franklin. Oh, jeez. And Commodore Stewart is like, no, this is not, <laughs> we're not doing this. And so the Commodore sends Levy back again to the United States with a note that basically says, to the captain that his choices are have Levy on board or lose his commission. Ooh. So the captain chooses the former and lets Levy on board. Mm, not the most auspicious start, though, is it? No. <laughs> you're not going to feel like, oh, welcome, come on in. You're going to feel very much like the new guy with a target on your back. And he definitely had a target on his back. Um, the officer's mess was not a, a friendly place to right. Lieutenant Levy. He also, this is the first time, I don't know how this is the first time, this happened, but this is the first time he witnessed a flogging. Oh, yeah, so right. Because we kind of think of that as sort of commonplace. You step out of line. They've got the cat of nine tails ready to go at any moment. They'll give you a quick one, two on the back and on you yeah, go. Yeah, so it's not usually two. Like So in the Navy, it would be like 20, 30 times. Jesus Christ. And it was Ugh. really brutal. And he yeah. was like, this is not okay. Like, we can't be doing this to people. No. So he was horrified about it. And he told everybody who would stand still long enough to listen that he thought this was like barbaric, mm. which did not make him very popular. Right. He's on deck one day and he sees a boatswain chasing two cabin boys to whip them. And he, he stops the boatswain. And gets into it with the boatswain, and Levy slaps the guy across the face. Another classic Levy move. But now, this time, he's an officer. So surely, this time, it's not such a big deal if he's slapping around the boatswain. Normally. Oh, no. <laughs> but the boatswain goes and tattles mm. to Levy's superior officers, who call Levy in and upbraids him in front of the boatswain, which is like... Mm. That's a, Not, a, like that is, that's, that's a break in the chain of command there. That's a right, bit strange. And, it's, and Levy is furious about this yeah, yeah. and is not quiet about how furious he is. And this argument that ensues ends up in his second court martial. <laughs> Me he's again. Oh, Uriah, come on in. Yep. He's charged with disobedience of orders, contempt of a superior officer, and unofficer-like conduct. Three charges, that's quite serious. Lovely. His captain, Captain Crane, the guy who didn't want to let him on the boat, he's the president of the court-martial. Oh, okay, that sounds fair. Yeah, so Levy's found guilty, dismissed from the ship. Big surprise. Which is way out, like, ungentlemanly like behavior would be usually be like, don't yeah. do that again, like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he slapped a dude, so they kicked him off the ship. That's, yeah. Especially a dude who was, like, below him in the chain of command. Yeah, yeah. It, which... That who was going to whip some children because like cabin boys right. are children. Yeah, as a reminder, the other time we've had slaps in this story, we've had like duels, we've had people being sent to prison, we've had people being, you know, I mean, it's like slaps are a big deal, right? Like slaps were yeah. really, a, I, slaps were maybe more of a big deal back then than now. If I, I, if so. I slap someone in the street, I don't expect to be in prison in another country in the following year, but you never know. Yeah, but you might expect to get punched back. I probably would, yeah. 
this was such a weird thing. So all all court marshals have to get signed off by the president of the United States because he's the commander in chief. Mm. And so this comes across the president's desk and he reads it and he's like, this is so weird. Why, why does this happen? This is ridiculous. The president of Monroe reverses the sentence. Oh, this gives me so much reverses. faith. I just sort of like by default, I guess I'm too cynical. I just imagine sort of a bunch of these things that come across Monroe's desk. He just whips off his John Hancock on them, just sends them through. But actually he's reading the fine print and making sure that justice is served. That is well done. Well done, Mr. Monroe. Don't get too excited. He's the Monroe oh, no. doctrine, do- doctrine guy. So like, <laughs> But that's later. Can't we celebrate now? Oh, no, forget it. <laughs> yeah, and I think they had less to do back then. Um <laughs> Right, he wasn't doom scrolling. Yeah, this was his only thing. And yeah. they're they're watching Fox News or whatever it is that <laughs> President Trump used to do. While this is going on, Levy gets into it again with another officer over who is to be rowed ashore by a particular rowboat. So this is very like two little kids. Yeah. I'm going to go on this ride now. I'm, I'm going to go on. Like they, it is that level of petty. Yeah. So they get into this whole argument. And Levy decides he's going to write a letter to this guy he had a disagreement with. Sir, the attack which you were pleased to make on my feelings this afternoon in saying I provocated, thereby insulting me in the grossest manner without any cause on my part, demands that you should make such concessions as this case requires before these gentlemen in whose presence I was insulted or to have a personal interview tomorrow morning at the Navy Yard, at which time, if you please, I expect a direct answer. Wow. Okay. Jeez. Say sorry in front of everyone or else is the translation into modern English. Yes. And so he goes to deliver this letter to Lieutenant Williamson, who throws it back in his face and closes the door. (laughs) And so Levy goes ashore and goes to all the taverns, like in Philadelphia, (laughs) and will read his letter to basically anybody who would hold still long enough. <laughs> He's a pest. So I'm imagining this guy, if he lived in the time age of social media, like yeah. this is like the 18th century version of going live. Yeah, yeah. Somebody's pissing you off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's, but he's also commenting it on everyone else's posts as well. Yes. The copy and paste of this. No, but also this thing about the, in the presence of everyone. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so he gets court-martialed again. Oh, <laughs> why? Because he was annoying. What's the charge this time? The charge is using provoking and reproachful words, treating his superior officer with contempt, and teaching others who choose to learn from his example to make use of falsehood as an easy convenience with scandalous conduct tending to the destruction of good morals and attempting to leave the ship without permission from the officer on deck. <laughs> is that just one charge or was that a litany? I'm- that was one. That's one. This is this is so archaic and baroque. It seems yes. just tailored just to be like the charge is you are Uriah P. Levy. I mean, that's what it sounds like. Yes, and Levy would agree with you because his defense was a brand new one. It had never been tried in courts in the United States before. He accused the Navy of being anti-Semitic. Well, like officially. Yes. <sighs> okay. So anti-Semitic was not a, a term that existed yet. This comes along later, before World War II, when Nazis decided they needed a a more fancy-sounding word than Judenhass, which means Jew hatred. Mm. They wanted to sound more scientific in their hatred of Jewish people. But it's a handy word, so we're using it. Right, yeah, of course. So he gives this whole speech about how, like, this is because he's a Jew. It doesn't work, and he gets thrown out of the Navy. No! And this would have been, this idea of anti-Semitism would have been a new idea to the officers in the hearing. In the U.S., Jews had the same legal rights as Christians, which was a relatively new thing on the historical Mm. stage. Yeah, they had the same rights, but... um, Right, so this is something we understand now. Jews has, I mean, there's probably quite a lot of the Jews in the U.S. had already fled Europe from where they'd been hated. But then again, a lot of the compatriots in the U.S. had come from Europe from where they were hating Jews. I mean, you know, it's not like it was... uh, a brand new invention but the first time in court is quite the thing that's incredible yes and part of the thing is in a lot of places in europe like germany in particular a lot of jews had to pay like a tax yeah. just for existing yeah like it was just you are a jewish person living in this right region you have to pay a tax 
And so for a lot of Americans, it was like, well, we don't do that. No. Yes, that's right. And so th- now we would call this things like microaggressions or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he's basically the first one who's coming forward and saying, this is also not okay. Yeah. I might have the same legal rights as everyone else, but you're treating me differently. Yeah, exactly. Which wasn't a new concept to Jewish people. No. It was a new concept to non-Jewish people. And a lot of Jewish people were really frustrated with him because they thought that he should be lying low and not making such a fuss. Mm. Levy is just the luckiest guy, I'll tell you what. This court martial ends up on the president's desk like it's supposed to. And the president, once again, is like, this is stupid. (laughs) (laughs) I agree again. What what the president says, Levy's behavior is inappropriate, but does not rise to the level of being removed from the Navy. And he puts him back in the Navy. And Levy gets a, a nickname now. Terrible tempered Lieutenant Levy. Mm. So Lieutenant William Weaver, who is the guy he had this disagreement about the rowboat with, thought that Levy was receiving special treatment for being oh. Jewish. What? They just kicked him out. You know what? It's damned if you do, damned if you don't with these kinds of things, isn't it? Yeah, which I think is something Levy understood. So a lot of his compatriots, especially in Philadelphia, these like kind of well-to-do Jewish people in Philadelphia were a lot of them were saying like you need to calm down. Yeah. Like, this is not good for the Jewish people. You're making us look crazy. Stop. Levy, I think, understood. Like you said, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Like, mm. there's no winning, so he needs to stand up for what he believes. Mm. So Lieutenant Weaver starts writing articles to newspapers in Washington, basically saying that, like, it, basically he's using his connections in the government with other Jews to... Oh, the old tropes come out. Yeah. Yep. All that stuff. So that ends up in another court-martial. Wait, who's being court-martialed this time? Weaver? Both of them. Both of them. (laughs) Children, behave. And they're both reprimanded. So Levy gets sent to another ship. Similar thing happens. He gets into it with an officer who accuses him of theft. And then he has his fifth court-martial, which is the same as the other one where it's just like, just reprimanded. So at this point, Levy is being ostracized by all the other officers. Yeah, I was about to say, it doesn't sound like he's got any mates. It sounds like, yeah. This does start to wear on him. Yeah. And so he applies for a six-month leave of absence. Okay, yeah. Go go to France, practice some of that French. Right, do some fencing. (laughs) Exactly. And his commanding officer says that he would be happy to give him that and that he would be happy to extend that leave of absence indefinitely. Uh, Oh, that's, yeah, well, I think we all know what that means. Yeah, so Levy, supposedly, asked him, is this because I'm a Jew? And the commanding officer apparently said yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least everyone's being honest. Oh, my God. That's that's the old-fashioned racism where they just said, yeah. Yeah, that, of, yep. I hate yep. you. <laughs> <laughs> because of your immutable characteristics, you see. Ah, got it. Right. Yeah, Roger. it's like, we're just, just, just <laughs> going to say it out loud. <laughs> Levy now has a lot of time on his hands, so he does two things with this. One is he writes a lot of letters to the editor to different like newspapers, admonishing his fellow Jews for putting up with anti-Semitism. Mm, right. So he's yeah. saying, like, stop turning the other cheek, stop just letting it go. You know, we need to stop this. And he also starts to invest in real estate in New York. Ah. At this time, it's 1824, the Erie Canal has been completed. And this was a major, major reason why New York became the prime city versus mm. Philadelphia, because it had both a deep water harbor and access to the West. Yeah, it's huge. So he see, he he sees what's happening and he buys a bunch of real estate in Manhattan and becomes extraordinarily wealthy overnight. Oh, man. And so he decides he's going to use his money to commission a statue of President Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, well, I mean, why not? You know, he he slapped he he gave him a fiver to build the synagogue. It's time to repay the man. Well, that was that was Franklin. Oh, but right. <laughs> how, wait, how old is how old's Levy at this point? Let me do math. Uh, it's it's 1824, and he was born in. It was like the end of the 17. So he's he's like mid 30s, I think. Uh, 92. So yeah, he's in his like 30s. So. He decides he's going to commission the statue of Jefferson. The reason why he wants to commission a statue of Jefferson is because Thomas Jefferson, we talk a lot of bad about Thomas Jefferson now when we talk about American history and with good reason. Do you? I don't, I don't know this. Why, why is, what's the controversy? So he enslaved people, but it wasn't just that he enslaved people, but he had a, one of the people he enslaved was this woman named Sally Hemings, who was mm-hmm. basically a child that he would carried on. 
But growing uh, up, I was told was an affair, but like. But she's a child. Child and also enslaved. Like the power dynamic there is. Yeah, that's horrible. Okay. Right. And this was like well known that he did this. Um, like we actually like, there are people who know that they are descendants of Sally Hemings and Thomas oh, Jefferson. Wow. Like this is very well documented. And so lately in the United States, we've been sort of grappling with our history. Mm. There's been a lot of negative talk about Jefferson for good reason. Right. But we have to remember Jefferson, what he was most known for at this time was he was like really all about religious liberty. Yeah. And this is not just religious tolerance, which is what a lot of the founding fathers were like. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Whatever religion you are, whatever. But Jefferson wanted like that sort of celebration of the diversity of the United States. Yeah. And he was the one who like, he wrote letters that said things like there should be a wall between church and state. Oh, that comes from him. Yeah. So like the whole concept of the separation of church and state that we have in the United States is really, it's not just Jefferson, but he was like a big mover and shaker to make that happen. Because isn't he one of the founding fathers? Yes, he is. He wrote the Declaration of Independence. Right. Yeah. So don't people remember him for that as well? Or is it just the fact that it used to be, he's just a great guy. He's like, maybe he's on the, the, is he on Mount Rushmore or something like that? And it's like, actually, turns out he was a bit of a shitbag as well. But it can be both, right? It can be both. Yeah. So it's that ladder of like, like when I was a kid, it was like, Jefferson, he wrote the Declaration of Independence and he was the third president of the United States. And he bought basically all of the United States from Napoleon right. uh, in the Louisiana Purchase. And yeah. we love this guy. He's great. And sure. now we're like, okay, he did those things. And and also check this shit out in his closet. Okay, cool. Yeah. We got the full picture. Got it. So, but we have to remember this time, we don't. No. This, is this before time the we're American building Civil statues. War. Yeah. This is before the American Civil War. We don't care that he enslaved people because we're still no. enslaving people. This is still happening. Right. So Levy, he's a big Jefferson fanboy. He has the statue made and he donates it to the United States government. And Congress has no idea what to do with this. <laughs> uh, thanks, Uriah. Um, <laughs> right, great. Today, that statue sits in the Capitol Rotunda in Washington, D.C. And it is the only statue, piece of art, I should say, the only piece of art in the Rotunda that was privately commissioned. No way. I've probably seen this. I've been to there. My brother used to live there in Washington, D.C. I remember I went to... Yeah, so the Rotunda, for anybody who hasn't been, is just like, it's all art. Yeah. It's art that is supposed to be sort of like representative of sort of the American psyche, so to speak. A lot of it's very problematic. Of course. My favorite part of it is on the top, like on the dome, there is the apotheosis of George Washington, where George Washington is literally like ascending into heaven like a deity. Yeah. So like, <laughs> Despite him saying, I'm not a god, guys. I'm really not. I'm not even going to continue being president. Stop deifying me. It's like, he's going to heaven. Oh, God. Oh, so it's this statue. That's incredible. I had no idea. Wow, that's brilliant. Amazing. Yes, yeah, so that was Uriah Levy. And huh. he also, at that time, buys Monticello. So Monticello was Jefferson's plantation. Oh, wow. It was in really bad repair at the time. So it's hard for us to imagine now, but this idea we have today of preserving historic homes mm. is a relatively recent concept. So, for example, the only surviving home of Benjamin Franklin is actually in London. We don't have any of Franklin's homes because they were knocked down to put in, like, roads and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, what is this old knockdown building? Get rid of it. We need a road. Basically, yeah. And so Monticello had been sold to this, uh, what is his name? This really weird guy. Oh, well, whatever. So he, the, some guy buys Monticello from the Jefferson family because all of these founding fathers, after they died, their families had all kinds of financial issues. Really? A lot of them made really bad investments in land speculation in the West. Oh, right. Of course, because this is when it's like, it could be the land of milk and honey out there, or it could just be Utah. You don't know. Yeah, actually, in a previous episode, we talk about this a little bit. In the episode, Public Universal Friend, we talk a little bit about why a lot of these investments went south. Cool. So a lot of these people died either penniless or their families were in trouble once they died and so forth. And so Monticello sold to this other guy who wants to make it a silk farm, which is an absolutely unhinged. <laughs> yeah, thing. okay. No. Well, I mean, look, people like, need silk. 
it's the wrong climate. Like, there's no, <laughs> this is not, this is not a thing. He didn't listen to his advisors, did he? No, he did not. And so Levy shows up and offers to buy the house and he gets it. Now, there's a couple different stories about how this happened. The most likely one, and I'm basing that on, this is the one that the historians at Monticello say is the most likely. So I'm going to trust them. Let's go with the official story. Is that when he went to Europe, to, so he goes to Europe during this time as well to study naval strategy and he meets the Marquis de Lafayette while he's there. Oh, cool. Who's an important Revolutionary War hero. And Lafayette, supposedly asked Levy to check in on the Jefferson family to make sure they're okay. Lafayette's super old by this point. Mm. And so he goes down to Virginia, sees the state of Monticello, and he's like, I, I need to do something about this. This is terrible. Um, I have no more money than I know what to do with. I'm unmarried, and I like have piles and piles of money. So he goes ahead and buys it. When he dies, he leaves it to the United States government, which ends up causing this whole legal issue, which normally it wouldn't have caused. Yeah. But because of when he died, he died like right at during the American Civil War. Oh, so, right. There isn't one government to leave it to at that point. Yeah. Right. So in the end, there's this whole protracted legal battle. Uh, Monticello ends up back in the Levy family's possession. And in the 1920s, a 501c3, so like a nonprofit organization, is formed to take care of Monticello, who's who owns it today. Ah, yeah. Okay. So it is. it did make it through. Good. Yeah. Yes. No, Monticello, you can go. It's a museum. I haven't been since I was a kid, so I don't know what the current state of their interpretation mm, is. Interesting. Yeah. But as far insofar as like how they handle slavery and so forth. Yeah. Um, so I can't speak to that because I haven't been there since I was ten, and I'm I'm hoping it's changed. Since yeah, then. you would you would hope so. Yeah. So he's he's you know he's buying Monticello. He's and he's fixing it up, and I think it's important to note. This isn't particularly important to his story, but just because of how American history is. I think it's important to note that at this point, Uriah Levy does purchase slaves mm. to fix up Monticello. Right. Yes. So at this point, he's a slaveholder. That's right. sort of the end of that conversation with Levy. I just think it's important to note. I, I, I would agree. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just, it's one of those, like we were saying about before about um, Jefferson, it's like, look, people can do good things and they can do bad things. And everyone is a product of their time. And I remember during the lockdown here, we had people, there's a statue of Churchill in the center of London and someone tagged it with Churchill was a racist, which objectively is true. He also defeated the Nazis in World War II. So let's just have a look at the whole rounded picture, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. And when you're talking about statues, it gets complicated because statues are statues versus like history. Yes. But with history, you can say just like, also he enslaved people anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> objectively bad. <laughs> objectively bad. Agreed. So surprise though. So he's doing all this. 1837, President Andrew Jackson signs a commission for Levy out of the blue and promotes him to the rank of commander. Wait, I thought he was out of the Navy, though. He was on leave. Yeah, but like on leave forever kind of thing. I, yeah, I mean, I guess he role. had, but he hadn't been discharged, right? right? So he was still technically, and at this point he was still an officer, wasn't he? Yes, so, he was a lieutenant. So, oh, he's just, so he's just a lieutenant. So what does he get promoted to? Commander. Which is a, that sounds like a high rank. I don't know exactly the ranking system, but it sounds good. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit of a Star Trek person. So commander's like the second down from captain. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. So he's, he's not Picard, but he's. He's Riker. He's, he's Riker. <laughs> he's sitting next to Picard. Cool. <laughs> so he gets the rank of commander. Actually, he's a little bit more like Cisco because he gets his own command as a commander. Oh, cool. So he so he gets this commander. He requests to be put on sea duty. And surprisingly, the Navy puts him on sea duty. And they give him the command of a ship called the Vandalia. So he's really excited. He goes down to Florida to pick up a ship. And it's like barely floating. Like it is in <laughs> really rough shape, both physically and the state of the crew. When he arrives, most of the crew is absent without leave, like AWOL in various taverns oh, in Pensacola no. and stuff. Oh, but they've, so, you know what? They've seen the job he's done on Monticello and they're like, he's a fixer upper. He'll get this ship shape in no time. Sure. Or they were like, let's <laughs> or just give him a bad They shape. gave him a dud. Yeah, it depends which interpretation you want to use. But Levy, he loves a challenge. Yeah. So, you know, he runs around, he finds all of his crew. Apparently, he had to like strap some of them to their hammocks because they were so drunk. Probably gave one or two of them a slap in his classic Something style. Something like that. And he, you know, gets the ship like fixed up. And while he's there, he announces, 
that there will be no flogging on his ship. Yes, there we go. He might have owned slaves, but God damn it, he's got some other principles that are important. Yes. Yes. And so, but the officers under him are like, you are inviting rebellion and mutiny. Like, this is... By getting rid of flogging. What, they loved yeah, because... flogging? Yes. Oh, no, they love flogging. <laughs> because they Catch thought that was it. the only way, the only way to control... Uh, right, 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 right. Yeah, that sort of old corporal punishment mindset of like, right. but how will we whip them into shape, literally and figuratively? Yeah, it's like, yes. you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. Right, like, good. That sort of yeah, yeah, concept. Yeah. So Levy, he's like, I got this, don't worry. <laughs> and he basically uses embarrassment as a punishment. <gasps> he was he the was... first to put the little placard around someone's neck. Actually, literally what the, that. <laughs> really? What? Re- I was just joking. He I don't know if he was it. for. I don't think right, no, no, I'm not saying first, but that, that was his punishment. Amazing. Go on. Yeah. So, like, for example, if somebody showed up drunk when they weren't supposed to, he had a, like, a, made a sign that was in the shape of a bottle around <laughs> the guy's neck. Yeah. Like drunkard's punishment that made him wear it around. There we go. That will do it. Shame's a powerful instrument. It really is. And then another bizarre one was there's a sailor who is mocking him. Hmm. Risky. So his punishment for this, this normally would be like you get a bajillion lashes with the cat or whatever. <laughs> sure. But what he does instead, this is so funny. He says, oh, you like mocking people. So like you're a parrot. So let's make you a parrot. So he like has the guy's like trousers pulled down on the deck and uses like a little bit of tar and like sticks like feathers on his butt. <laughs> and he has to stand there getting laughed at by the crew. For, like, oh five no, God. Yeah, you're not going to do it again after that, are you? Right. The Vandalia is sailing around Mexico to support the American consulates down there because mm-hmm. there was a lot of anti American sentiment. We're also now into the sort of build up to the Mexican American War, right? Which happens in the 1840s. Eventually, Vandalia comes back to port and Levy was without orders and the Navy refused to give him any. So basically he's grounded again. Mm. So he's not like in trouble. It's just like, no, there's just not, nothing to do, nothing nowhere to, to do. go. Mm. Yeah. So he keeps on doing real estate, making lots of money and whatever. Two years later, he gets a notice that he's getting court-martialed. God, I bet he yeah. couldn't believe his eyes. He's like, I thought this was all behind me. It says court-martial number six for those keeping track at home. <laughs> ding, ding, ding for the drinking game. And what he's being brought on, charges of is forgery cowardice and scandalous conduct and these are actually very serious like accusations forgery i get i mean i don't get you're going to explain it to me yeah. uh conduct i get cowardice is not a crime <laughs> that's just a, it's a it's a it's a flaw in your character sure it's a moral defect it's not a crime yeah well apparently in the navy it is <laughs> so, the forgery thing was he made some sort of clerical mistake and some paperwork. Oh, right. Which okay. For anybody else would have been like, whatever, but they hate him. So, for Yeah, them. right. The cowardice, he allowed a man to wring his nose without resistance. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Which Carry. is all I know about that. And I have so many questions. I, I know, answers. me too. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> Especially knowing that he's like not afraid to slap people. So like what happened? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Presumably it was all fine. Otherwise you'd have slapped him. But right. you know. No. I, I think know. that's another damned if you do, damned if you don't, because if he slaps him, then it's violent conduct and all of that. Yeah, and the cruel and scandalous conduct. Remember that story I told you about the guy where he like glued the feathers to the guy's butt? Ah, that. That. That was a cruel and scandalous conduct. Should have just flogged him, of course. That wouldn't have been cruel. Right, exactly. He's also accused of having failed to set an example of decency and propriety in his own personal conduct, which is in reference to the fact that when he fixed up the ship, he decided to paint the guns blue just for fun. What's wrong with that? I I don't know. (laughs) I love the way you said that. So (laughs) defeated. I don't know. I mean, what the, what could be wrong with it? It's such bollocks, isn't it? (laughs) I mean, I do understand the Navy has a certain level of like... (laughs) Right. Jamesies, but like at sure. the time, especially in the Navy, like what people were really like independent operators on these ships. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. In a way that they're not now because you can have that communication very quickly. Not that I know very much about the military, but I know that they don't like people sort of being different. Right, yeah, that's right. And so he goes to trial and Levy makes the tactical error of announcing to the court that he thought this whole thing was ridiculous. Hmm. Where's and his so, legal counsel? 
Uh, yeah, seriously. <sighs> so the trial drags on, and people are accusing him of traumatizing that sailor that he put feathers it's on. Tar on the feathers, yeah. Traumatizing. Yeah. I guess being hit with a cat of nine tails would have not. No, been that's fine. You just brush it off like it's nothing. But feathers on your butt that will live with you for the rest of people your life. People laughed at him for five whole minutes, <laughs> and so Levy is dismissed from the navy. No way, it finally happens. Wait, hold on. Well, hold on. Dad. Hold on. Levy, missed, talk about Cat and Nine Tails. He's missed the Levy Nine Lives. Let's see. Now we have President John Tyler. He's still all these presidents that nobody remembers. I don't know anything about him, I'll be honest. Nobody does. He probably doesn't know anything about himself either. He's <laughs> uh, a very forgettable president. But John Tyler, he has to sign this thing and he reads mm. it over. And he was a lawyer before he was president. And so he understood the law. And he said, you know, the punishment doesn't match the crime. Mm. And so he goes back to the Navy and says, like, reconsider your punishment. Right. And the court refused. And it made a big fuss about how traumatizing this was for the sailor. And President Tyler basically does the president presidential version of, like, are you serious? <laughs> And he mitigates the sentence to 12 months suspension without pay. Okay. Which he then mitigates even further a few months after that by just getting rid of the suspension and promoting Levy to captain. Whoa! Now Levy's Picard. Yes. Yes. So this is 1844. So he is a, a captain. The Navy refuses to put him on active duty. So Levy, lots of time in his hands, has already made enormous piles of money. He starts publicly attacking the practice of flogging. Right, yeah. Okay. Writing articles. He's communicating with people in Washington. And in the end, a lot of members of Congress start using Levy's words that he's written to fight against flogging in the Navy. It gets picked up by a Senator, John P. Hale of New Hampshire, who ends up pushing through a law which makes flogging illegal in the United States Navy by, in 1850. Yes. So that's the other thing that like when you go to like the Navy's website and you look up this guy is they say that he's responsible for the ending of the practice of flogging in the Navy. So, and, and because he was now a, a man of standing, a man of rank in the army, his words matter a lot more. So he gets Yeah, it. he obviously knew had a network. Yeah. He, he always seems to know people. If, eventually, yeah. I mean, but through sheer persistence, I, a lot of people would have given up a lot earlier. But there we go. <laughs> Good man. 1853. Okay. So he's in his 60s now. Yeah. Yeah. He gets married. Finally. He is 61 years old. He gets married to a woman named Virginia Lopez. She's 18. Okay. <laughs> and his niece. Oh, no. This is a real, real weird arc for the story to take at this late <laughs> venture. <laughs> the, he claims that he did this in order to protect her citing the biblical tradition of the closest unmarried male family member to marry an orphaned or widowed oh, member of the family. There is that in the Bible. That is yeah, true. Yeah, it, it is there. But even at the time, people were like, this is very yeah. weird. <laughs> like, right, good. Like, if, if it's like 1850s and people think it's weird, it's yeah. very weird. <laughs> That's true. That's the standard. But I will say it is, we don't know. Okay. You know, the whole, what happens behind closed doors. Right. And we don't have her words, presumably, so we've just got this story to go on. Not really, yeah. Yeah. But there don't seem to be any records of him being any sort of ladies' man. No. I feel like if there had been, we would have heard about it. Yeah, that's the first it. time any kind of romantic part of the story has, has happened, and he's in his 60s, so. Yeah, yeah. I, like, honestly, I have to wonder if he was, like, queer in some way or whatever. But yeah. No, like, evidence quote unquote of that besides the no. lack of a relationship he certainly had time it wasn't like he was at sea yeah exactly often. maybe just caught sort of asexual or non-romantic just not motivated right. by that yeah like we don't know we don't know but i feel like if he was a philanderer we would have heard about it because yeah clearly they were attacking this guy with everything they could find right so we would have found it they also they never had children right so we don't know interesting so uh, Hmm. I'd like to think that it was a yeah. Look what he said it was. That would be it. Would be a nice uh, yeah. That's the it's the more charitable interpretation. We've got no right. reason to assume it's not that. Or so yeah. Yeah, and I admit is I'm somewhat biased, and I want him to. Not Me too. Be I mean, terrible. he is the he's the hero of the story <laughs> right now. I mean, we've already admitted to some of his flaws. We don't need to start making up new charges. Yeah. So that happened. We don't really know what was going on there but 
here's here's the big event of Levy's life. And over an hour, 15 minutes in, I tried really hard to make my notes as short as possible. But this man just like, this is I actually cut, I cut stuff out. No way. Like this is, this is the bare bones version of his life. 1855, Congress approves an act to promote the efficiency of the Navy, which among other things calls for Navy personnel who are too old or sick to perform their duties to be put on reserve duty and those who are incapable of performing their duties for another reason to be thrown out of the Navy. Hmm. Okay. Right. So big reform, big changes. You know, on the surface, it's like, I don't know. Okay. Efficiency of the Navy sounds great. Right. Sure. Well, shocking. No one, I'm sure at this point. No. Levy is on the list of people to be thrown out. Right. Yeah, exactly. At this point, it's been 16 years since he's had active orders. And so he's furious and he's not going to like, He's not going to take this lying down. No way. It's not his style. So he hires the best lawyer he could find, a gentleman named Benjamin Butler, who also served as the attorney general under President Jackson. So this is like a <laughs> big deal guy. Yeah. And he petitions Congress to overturn this decision. So basically he says to Congress, he petitions Congress and says, look, this is un-American mm. because all these decisions were made behind closed doors. Like there was no, there was no accusation made. There was no opportunity for people who are being thrown out to speak for themselves. To appeal, yeah. It's all clandestine, cloak and dagger stuff, undemocratic. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so it takes Congress a year, but they overturn that part of, they say that basically anybody who's chucked out needs to have a hearing. Mm. It taking a year is not like, Congress has never been efficient. Yeah. Like this is just, this is how Congress has always operated. Yeah. If anything, that's speedy. And also the center of his complaint though, he's like, look, you don't know how good I am at this point because I haven't been at sea for 16 years and not for lack of wanting right. to be. And he also says, like, look, I think I'm being punished for being a Jew. So now that is officially in the congressional record. So for the first time now, we have on the congressional record somebody complaining about anti-Semitism, the United States. Gosh, no, which is a he's big a, deal. Brave, a brave man. Yeah, so this is the first time he's now being publicly identified. It's on the floor of Congress. Yep. This is a big deal. He's now allowed to have, like, an inquiry to determine whether or not he's going to get thrown out of the Navy. Leaving his lawyer do everything they can to get so much attention on this from the press. And Levy, I think, surprising no one at this point, is very dramatic. <laughs> yeah. He's very good at putting on a show. And his lawyer is the same way. So, like, they have everything, like, thought down to, like, how he's going to, like, go to, like, where court is. At the time, his statue of Jefferson was outside the White House. Uh... So they made sure they went by that. And he's like, yeah, I paid for that. <laughs> good PR good comms he knows what he's doing oh yeah so they have the court the navy or the inquiry the navy brings out a parade of witnesses who testify against levy including several people who like had never met him oh god they bring up all of his court martials which butler tries to take out from the court saying like these are you know resolved yeah. issues yeah, exactly. um, but he's unsuccessful in that um and he also tries to get it like okay fine if we're having it in the court we need to relitigate all of these and that also is unsuccessful but so the defense gets their turn. So they brought their own witnesses, including 13 active duty naval officers. They they make sure each of these people says that all of Levy's problems stem from anti-Semitism. Wow. People just don't like him because he's a Jew. And these people are willing to go on record and say that. Yes. Whew. That's dangerous for them active, as well. Active duty officers. And then there were three written depositions. Uh, so there's 19 witnesses and three written depositions, and they're all they all follow the same the same argument. Mm. Normally, at this point, with an inquiry like this, the defense would have rested their case, but not Butler. <laughs> so he like flings open the doors of the room, and in streams like 50 something character witnesses. Wow! And these are people ranging from bank presidents to senators of the United States to editors of major newspapers to state governors like really Ooh. any sort of person you can imagine who was important in the united states at that time was in that room to speak towards the positive character of uriah levy whoa geez pulling out the big guns and the theatrical nature of it is just yeah oh yeah in the end the defense brought 75 witnesses wow in total so the press loved this yeah. The press was like all about this. And so now the American public for the first time, they'd never heard of this guy. Right. Like I've never heard of a random captain in the Navy. Like, exactly. 
So now all of a sudden the American public not only knows who Uriah Levy is, they know what anti-Semitism is. Mm. And they have opinions about it for the first time in American history. So he gives his final his final words in court, which are as inspiring as you might imagine. He says, yes, I, I want to hear the military drums in the background. Oh, Another, yes. It's a Levy special, everybody. Here we go. We know we know he's got a flair for the written word and the spoke. He sounds like he was quite the orator. He's about to take the floor in his big moment in court. Okay, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's very long. What is my case today? If you yield to this injustice, may tomorrow be that of the Roman Catholic or the Unitarian, the Episcopalian or the Methodist, the Presbyterian or the Baptist. There is but one safeguard, and this is to be found in an honest, wholehearted, inflexible support of the wise, the just, the impartial guarantee of the con- Constitution. Brilliant. It's like um, it's like the Pastor Niemöller quote, the famous, first they came for the trade unionists and I did yes. not speak out. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And he won. Yes. He won the case. He's back in the Navy. And he was put on active duty. And he was assigned to command the Macedonian, which was a ship in the Mediterranean. And oh, Nice. <laughs> that sounds like a cushy job. Well, it gets even cushier because he, <laughs> he like, this is, this was never done before then. It's never been done since. He manages to convince them to let him bring his wife aboard. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. And apparently she treated it like her own personal cruise. <laughs> of course. Where to next, darling? Corfu. <laughs> like there's some really funny like accounts of sailors being like, she had a different dress on every time she came on deck. And apparently he was like super annoyed with her. It sounded like he was like right. kind, of, kind of done with, with his uh, young wife of his. I bet the sailors um, weren't. <laughs> so he's uh, he's in command of the ship. In 1860, he's put in charge of it, the entire Mediterranean fleet, which effectively oh. makes him a commodore. Yeah. Which at the time was the highest rank in the Navy. It's not anymore, but it was at the time. And the American Civil War breaks out, 1861. But... Levy's age catches up with him finally. He's in his 60s. He's too ill con- to continue and he yeah. has to retire. Yeah. And he dies March 26th, 1862, buried in Beth Elam Cemetery in Ridgewood, which is in Queens in New York. And like I said before, he left Monticello and an absolutely like huge amount of money to the maintenance of Monticello to mm. the United States government, which gets really complicated. But he he left only the minimum amount required by law to his wife oh uriah what why what did what what did he do with the rest of the money various philanthropic oh okay right 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 his family was pretty mad because they were yeah it's like um would you mind keeping some of that in the family yeah apparently no he would not like to do that (laughs) god she shouldn't have worn so many goddamn dresses i know right 1942 his name is given to a destroyer called the uss levy Wow. What I find, so Levy, he actually, he wanted there to be a life-size statue of himself sure. put above his grave, which did not happen. That's a bit there much. Is, there is a kind of sad little statue of him in Philadelphia, outside next to Israel. And what he wanted to be remembered as was, you know, a fighter of anti-Semitism yeah. and the one the person who ended flogging yeah. in the Navy. Which he is remembered for. Which, well, yeah, we're remembering him right now for it. And it sounds like that is the... The official story as well. I mean, that's those are yeah, two big things. They are big things. And what I think is interesting, though, when you look at his history, is it was really hard to find sources on this guy without going into like archival stuff, which I did not go into mm-hmm. archival stuff. Right. So the book I use predominantly is actually maybe not the best book from a like historical point of view. It's this like older book about. America's Sephardic elite is what it's called. Oh, so the grandees. And it's about lots of people from that era. Yeah. And when you look him up, it's really, he saved Monticello. He ended flogging. There's no reference in his biography on the Navy's website about any of his court martials. Hmm. And that was actually why I went to the Navy website, because I wanted to get the years for the court martials. And I assumed it would be there. And there was not a single reference. How strange. Yeah, just whitewash it. Very much so. And so what I think is interesting in looking at Levy, like why, and this is always the question with this podcast of like, why are we looking at these people? Right. I mean, Levy's an obvious one because he's like super fun to talk about. Like he's just a a character. Yeah. But it's more than that. He 
he, he so he was he was a pain in the butt. People didn't like him, <laughs> although apparently a lot of people did like him. But he was he was a massive pain. And honestly, if he lived in the age of social media, mm. I would probably be following him just to watch the train wreck. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He might have been cancelled by now a few times, but somehow bounced back. Or would in have been out there canceling other people. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And so now we can look back and say, well, he was right. Right. He was one hundred percent right. He and now we accept this idea that you can have anti Semitism or racism or what have you that is not based in the law, that is based in just these um these societal things. Yeah, exactly. And it can come under the cloak of something else, like these, you know, trumped up charges. Um, but actually, you know, wink wink, nudge nudge, actually we all know what it is, and he was brave enough to call it out for what it was. Yes. Which is not an easy thing to do. And no. I think it bears thinking about when today we have similar situations with mm. people. And this is this is a thing with anti-Semitism still today because anti-Semitism functions differently than other hatreds of races and ethnicities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Have you read, um, uh, there's a David Baddiel book called uh, Jews Don't Count. He's, he's a Jew. I haven't read it, but it's on my list. It's an amazing book. It's quite a short read, so you'll get through it quite quickly. But he's got this interesting idea in there of um, Jews are, he calls them Schrodinger's whites. Yes. Because they are both white and the most white when they need to be, and yet not at all white when they need to be, um, to their detriment, right? And it's... Uh, it's that's why it's 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 uh it is it's got a unique flavor to it mm, what's that that's the unique flavor of anti-semitism yes and to, i i do think it's important to also point out that not not all jews are white but yeah of course not. um yes but when you're talking about white jews it is very much whatever is convenient for people at that moment yeah. either we are you know dying in the holocaust sure or we are like too powerful yeah and have you know too much control or whatever um so yeah and this is coming up now like we yeah. are we are dealing with this very presently as anti-semitism continues to rise around the world we also see it with other ethnicities in the united states we had a lot we and continue to have a lot of anti-asian sentiment mm. that looks very similar mm. to anti-semitism it, it functions at least in the united states it functions in a very similar way is this idea of people from asian countries are not fully american yeah and this That's idea of the right. model minority myth and like Yep, that's right. And and I've, I've read quite a lot about this as well. I'm interested in it because they're treated as sort of like also that kind of like they're kind of quote unquote white in that way. They get the privilege yeah. of it, but then they're not when we need to discriminate against them. And of course, they have their own incredibly storied history in the in the US with um, with the railroad and with the internment yes. camps and, and all kinds of. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's, and it's, they have the added thing of like you can really you can sometimes it, so in, to, depending on where you are in the United States, mm. you can't always tell a Jew by looking at them. Right, right, right. So yes. like where I live, there's a lot of Italian folks. There's a lot of people from like Eastern Europe. Yeah. So it's just, there's a lot of like ethnic whites, as you may put it. So yes. there's more variety in like facial structures and yeah. coloration and stuff than in other parts of the United States. Yeah. So the so, assimilation question is is different. It's a different paradox, a different puzzle to solve, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but you go to Little Saigon in Philly and, like, there's no question. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Who's from the Asian continent and who's not. Yeah. And so there's obviously an added piece there. But I think it's important to think about and to think about it's easy for us to look back at Levy and say, like, well, he was definitely right because he was. Mm. He was also a hothead. Yeah. And there is a part of me that's like, there might have been another way to go about this. It didn't involve punching people in the face. (laughs) You know what? I don't know. Maybe there wasn't. It's that's it's a perennial question, I think that isn't it. That's because um, obviously his community were like, "Hey, look, shush, don't don't say anything, right?" And it's like, it's it. I'm always torn with this because it's like growing up, my mum was always quite outspoken, right? So she'd do some like say something in public if she saw something that she thought was wrong. She'd like say something, and I'd be embarrassed and be like, mm. "Oh, just just you know, don't." But then, you know, the more I look back and sort of think, actually, no, she was actually standing up for something that was she believed in and someone else was doing something that was wrong. And people just keep their head down and don't want to say anything and just want a quiet life. But things don't change if you if you do that. Right. Things don't change. And also there's the other side of it is sometimes if you are very aggressive, it's hard to you can turn people off. It can. So 
I have yeah. friends who are, who are political organizers who do a lot of work. Like I've, I have been lucky enough to be in places like in the deep South where, you know, I'm having conversations with these like primitive Baptist ministers about family values. Mm. Meanwhile, I'm this like Jewish person married to a woman it, because I did not like jump in me like, Oh no, no, no. Like yeah. we were able to have a really great conversation yeah. and found a lot of common grounds that like, yeah. Really, at the end of the day, what is family values? And this is less of a buzzword than it is than it was like 15 years ago, but but still, yeah. What, what are family values? It's it's having stable families that mm-hmm. you know are good places to raise kids and things like that. And I'd like to think that I might have changed a mind that day. I think so. I take I, it a little more gently, but yeah. sometimes you got to take it the Levy route too, because some people will just ignore it if you don't make a really big fuss yeah this is it's such an interesting uh, do you know who daryl davis is not offhand no so he's this um he's now a political activist he was a blues mu- uh, musician he has converted personally over 300 members of the ku klux klan he's a black man ah. he talks to them he and they end up giving him their hoods so he's got this collection of it and a lot of it is just through that just talking just getting people to talk and realizing that hey we're all just humans and it's like a lot of the time that hatred that bias comes from not knowing not understanding um and but sometimes sometimes you can't get through just with words that is the tricky part but it takes all sorts in this world doesn't it some people are the talkers and some people are the face slappers <laughs> yeah and i think you need both yeah I agree. Um, like I, I think I think that you need to to go to the example we always have in the United States. You need Martin Luther King and you need Malcolm X. Right. Like you need both of them. Otherwise it's ineffective. Yeah. And sometimes you need Levy who's just <laughs> gonna say what he thinks. Yeah, well I think we all need a bit of Levy. That was a great story. What, what an interesting yeah. life. Yeah, he is he is one of my favorites. I love his statue, unfortunately, is not very well cared for, which I don't wanna like I'm not disparaging that synagogue. They are they do wonderful things. They take care of all the like abandoned Jewish cemeteries mm-hmm. in town. So all the like synagogues don't exist anymore. So like I understand Levy's statue not being like top priority right. here. <laughs> so I just don't want people to think I'm like going after them. <laughs> and it makes a little sad because I go by and I'm like, oh, it's not looking great, that statue. But I'm glad he got a statue. Yeah, he still got one. And I think it's worth remembering all the parts of his story, not just that he ended flogging, which is important, but also the parts that are like maybe don't always make him look like the most calm yeah. person in the world. That's because right. Those are important. Contentious perhaps at times, but um I think I think we've all been in a position where we've wanted to say something. We've but we've been afraid. Yes. Um and I think Levy is a bit of a, a lesson in uh, in bravery against odds of speaking your mind. Um and that doesn't it's not necessarily always the right thing to do but it's but it's a brave thing to do and bravery is difficult and he, he had he did not have the easiest life and he got through a lot of i mean let's not forget yeah he ended up a very wealthy man he started as a cabin boy this is the lowest of the low and yes. he you know he didn't have connections he fought his way up and he against all odds made it to the t- i mean it's it's a version of the american dream oh yeah he's he's like this minority religion minority ethnicity yeah and just like against all odds manages to be successful in multiple realms of american life this is what this is what we want america to be right like this is the like the ideal this is the like i don't know like there's a uh, living in philadelphia and i work as a tour guide and there's mm-hmm. this there's this um one person show that one of the museums does called mm. we the people and i mm-hmm. always joke that like i never feel prouder of being an american at the end of that show because by the end you're just like oh my god <laughs> yeah and all the europeans in the audience are like are, are you guys okay <laughs> like, <laughs> no but it is it's it's something uh it's something it's, it's one of my personal i mean my wife's american so I, i'm a bit biased i suppose but it's one of my favorite things about america is 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 what it's founded on you know you have Uh, it's the same as like the modern state of France. That's why they gave you guys the Statue of Liberty. It's like you're founded on principles, principles that are important. So many countries are just founded because they were there or someone drew a line on a map or someone killed someone else. Or it's like, you know, this is actually something important and worth cherishing and protecting and not, uh, you know, not taking for granted. And one of the things I, I think about a lot 
we air our dirty laundry here in the United States in a way that I think is good and important. Mm. So I remember when I was in college, I traveled through Europe, and this was during the Bush administration. Mm-hmm. And so everybody I met needed to hear my opinions on George W. Bush. Yep. <laughs> and um, it got a little tiresome. I can imagine. Honest. Yeah. I thought there was something good in that. You know, we mess up a lot recently, especially, oh my God. But yeah. <laughs> but through our history, we've messed up. Like, yeah, we are founded on principles, but it's not that like, this wasn't like an empty piece of dirt. Like there were people living no. here who yep. were displaced and genocided and all these things. Yep. Well, it's it's that because of colonization. Yeah. But, but it can but, be, but like we say, it can be both. Yeah. Like, and we, we air our dirty laundry and we speak up like Levy. Like when we are at our best, we are putting it all out there. Yeah, and you know, uh, it reminds me to bring back Churchill. I, I'm, I'm going to sound like I'm a Winston Churchill fan. I'm not, but um, there's a good quote. <laughs> there's, I mean, I am, but I'm not. Do you know what I mean? But there's a good quote which I think speaks to what you're saying, which is that democracy is the worst form of government apart from all the rest. You know, and it's like, yeah, it is. It is about airing the dirty laundry. It is imperfect. But it it is actually the best version that we've got. And we can keep refining it and don't hide things away. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed, but also don't sit on your laurels. Don't rest back and don't think it's perfect. It's a project. Oh, yeah. And the, the founding fathers, they called this the American experiment. Mm-hmm. And I like that because an experiment is an active thing. It's something you do. Exactly. Like one of the things I like to end my tours with, and I think I'll and this with because it's apropos of it here in philadelphia one of the most popular things to see is the liberty bell right which is this famously cracked bell and there's all kinds of history of like how it got cracked how it was fixed and then cracked again and blah blah blah, blah. But none of that really matters hmm. the reason why the liberty bell is the liberty bell is because there's a quote at the top from leviticus says and they shall proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof and this quote was selected to refer to the fact that philadelphia had religious freedom from the beginning, which was a unique thing in the United mm. States and anywhere, really. But why it became famous is because it it cracked the first time it was used. So they like hung it up, rang it, and it cracked. <laughs> um, there's a whole lot of back and forth with the foundry in Europe and whatever. But mm. abolitionists started using the Liberty Bell as a symbol on their newspapers because the bell was proclaiming liberty like we had done with like the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and all this stuff. Mm. But it's imperfect. Mm. It has this crack in it. And just as American liberty was and still is in a lot of ways imperfect. And I think it's really great that like the thing that people want to see when they're in Philadelphia is this example of, of this a symbol of the fact that we're not there yet. <laughs> That yeah. This is something we're still working on. Yeah. We're still trying to figure out. Um, and I think without people like Levy, we aren't going to get there. Yeah. I agree. Well, a wonderful way to sum it up. And what a lovely uh, uh, metaphor for for what something is. Yeah. It's uh, it's still a bell, you know? It, it is might, still a bell. <laughs> might have a crack, but it's still a bell. <laughs> Not a very good bell, but... Uh, <laughs> It does its best. <laughs> yeah. It's the worst bell apart from all the rest. <laughs> yes. It actually, it, it's it's a uh, sibling bell, so to speak, hang up in Christchurch. Nobody cares about those bells because they work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for My joining pleasure. me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, on this, and thank you for everybody listening for hanging with us. It's longer than our episodes usually are. Oh, um, but Levy's got a lot going on in his life, yeah. and I didn't want to cut out any of those court marshals. No, so. they were all excellent. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to D Listers of History. If you enjoyed yourself, be sure to subscribe and drop us a review on whatever platform you listen on. We are a weekly podcast. Next Monday, February 12th, we will release a sidebar episode where we will discuss the history surrounding some sort of current event. Our next full episode will drop Monday, February 19th. I will chat with tea expert and educator Nicole Wilson about Robert Fortune, the man who went undercover to steal tea from China on behalf of the East India Company. Go to our show notes for links to all of our various social media pages and our website. We would love to connect with you. You can also find links to Robert's website and podcast there as well. 
A big thank you to our Patreon members. We couldn't do this without your wonderful help and encouragement. Coming up soon on the Patreon, I will post the bits and pieces of this episode that I just had to cut, but they're still a lot of fun to listen to, so keep an eye out for that. And now for an episode-relevant audio drop. And so Calendar puts out a piece of information so damning nobody could survive it. Hey, guess what? Jefferson's not as cool as you think. Uh, he is having an affair with Sally Hemings. Who's Sally Hemings? Oh, just his slave. Everyone is like, what? Are you kidding me? What did Jerry think about that pamphlet? <laughs> so Jerry is like, did you hear about this? And Jefferson goes, don't put it so close to my face, Jerry. for listening to the show if you've enjoyed it please give us five stars and consider becoming a subscriber and maybe even supporting us on patreon it really 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 helps me continue making this show uh, if you haven't enjoyed it then you can fuck off. many many thanks to nils hennis steer for the amazing music and to dave fox for the cool artwork please keep coming back every week for more bliss of the abyss